Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out on a snowy night after a very sunny day yesterday. It's kind of a shock. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to Boston College and to this evening's event in BC's Park Street Corporation Speaker Series, Health, Humanity, and Ethics. Um, I'm Amy Boski. I'm um, Chair of the English Department and Director of BC's Minor in Medical Humanities, Health, and Culture. And with my colleague, Jim Keenan, from Theology, who unfortunately is away this evening, we direct BC's Park Street Corporation Speaker Series. The Speaker Series launched in 2016. We've had a, a thematic um, bond each year, and this year we've been exploring the health of the planet. We've had a really wonderful group of speakers, and tonight are really fortunate to have Willis Jenkins with us, who has had a long day of travel, had to go south to come north, um, and we're really glad that he's here. Um, the goal of the speaker series is to address timely issues in the intersecting fields of health, humanity, and ethics. We are greatly appreciative both of the corporation and the late Father Quinn, whose generous commitment to civic conversation and the common good aligns so well with the mission of Boston College. So we're honored this evening to have Willis Jenkins with us, whose talk will be titled, The Ethics of Food and the Health of the Planet. Willis will be introduced by my colleague, Andrea Vicini, from BC School for Theological Ministry. Following the talk, there'll be time for questions, and if I could ask you now just to silence cell phones and other things that beep as we welcome Andrea, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you. As Professor Boeski just said, we are very grateful to welcome Professor Willis Jenkins at Boston College. After his studies at Wheaton College and at the University of Virginia, where his training focused on contemporary environmental ethics and on classical Christian theology. Professor Jenkins taught at Yale University as Margaret Farley Professor of Social Ethics, while at the same time, he had an appointment at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Since 2013, he teaches at the University of Virginia as Professor of Religion, Ethics, and Environmental Studies, and co-director of, of the Institute of Practical Ethics. Currently, he's also directing an environmental humanities lab that develops transdisciplinary reflections on coastal changes at the University of Virginia's <coughs> long-term ecological research site, funded by the National Science Foundation. At the University of Virginia, his courses study religion, ethics, and global environment, global ethics and climate change, the model ecology of food, environmental ethics, and method and inquiry in religious ethics. His courses are a further confirmation of his ongoing research interests. Professor Jenkins' research explores the intersections of religious ethics with environmental humanities. In his first book project, Ecologies of Grace, Environmental Ethics and Christian Theology, published in 2008, he undertook comparative theological readings in the context of modern environmental questions. <coughs> his book won a John Templeton Award for Theological Promise. More recently, his interests broadened to interpret other models of religious engagement with environmental thought, including the relations of ethics and environmental sciences, particularly Christian social ethics, and his reckoning with economics and political violence. As a result, he published The Future of Ethics, Sustainability, Social Justice, and Religious Creativity published in 2013. And this book won an American Academy of Religion Award for Excellence. Moreover, Professor Jenkins is also interested in reflecting on method as well as on global ethics, by focusing particularly on climate ethics and on morality in the Anthropocene. Together with the co-edited Routledge Ledge Handbook of Religion and Ecology, published last year, 
and recent articles on plutocracy, on virtual ethics in climate discourse, and on Pope Francis. His remarkable list of peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and scholarly lectures confirm his outstanding expertise and commitment in reflecting ethically on sustainability and in promoting the sustainable conditions of life for our planet. Finally, he's currently writing a book on how the ethics of food matters for post-natural environmental thought. Tonight's lecture on the ethics of food and the health of the planet witnesses his interest in food studies. <coughs> Without further ado, Professor Louise Jenkins. Um, there's so many good people in this room, and I just want to thank you for being here. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I want to start off by um, alleviating an anxiety that you may have. If you came tonight for this lecture, slightly worried that a professional ethicist is going to tell you what you're obligated to eat. Um, I'm not here to prescribe for you a diet. I understand that Michael Pollan has been here already in this series, so you received the food rules. I don't know anything about that. I said I want to try and think in this, this space between the ethics of food and the health of the planet. So I'm going to explore possible connections between arguing over food rules and interpreting ecological change at a larger scale. So specifically, I'm going to test the possibility that everyday foodways may carry the potential, under certain conditions, to function as sites of deep cultural change. And in a period of cynical climate politics, that holds the, the possibility that reforming food waste can nourish a kind of long-term ecological hope, even in dark times. One other disclaimer. So I teach in religious studies, as you know. Um, and I'm going to use some religious examples at some points to make these connections between the ethics of food and the health of the planet. But I want to be clear from the outset that it's not my view that you need religion to make these connections. <coughs> Although it is possible that you will leave here thinking that I have, in a sneaky kind of way, argued just that. <laughs> we'll see. So let me start from a religious case. Um, Scholars of religion have an enduring interest in food rules among the Abrahamic traditions. The distinctions there are especially well marked. Judaism keeps kosher, Islam keeps halal, Christianity marks its difference by prohibiting food prohibitions, and each has distinctive feasts and fasts and many local variations on the rules. And I'm interested in a particular set of variations. The emergence of eco-kosher, eco-halal, and a Christian vegetarian movement to reinstitute prohibitions. <laughs> so these variations, they, they are interesting to me because they bear disruptive potential for their traditions insofar as religious foodways produce a particular identity. Revising them can call into question the authorizing logic that connects a religious body to its symbolic order. For example, if the rationale for eating halal is that it has been revealed that some foods are permissible and others are forbidden, and not because halal is more hygienic or humane or healthier, then eco-halal can seem almost disobedient in its excess of dietary piety, adding new stipulations that are not grounded in the Quran or Hadith by referring to contemporary ecological ideas. And indeed, eco-halal is regarded in just that way sometimes with suspicion for departing from the culinary expression of Muslim identity. And so too, for eco-kosher and Christian vegetarianism, revising the food way renegotiates the logic of identity expressed in the food regime. So what to make? What to make of those variations? What's going on there? So keep that question in mind. And I want to turn to uh, planetary scales. A cultivated planet. Jonathan Foley, an ecologist, writes with many colleagues in a widely cited Nature article of that title, that agriculture is a massive driver of global environmental change, pushing multiple systems beyond what scientific global resilience call safe operating space for humanity. And depending how we count semi-cultivated forests, agriculture takes a path or more of the 
arable, ice-free land surface of the planet. So major planetary systems have been reshaped by how we feed ourselves. Planetary nitrogen, the phosphorus cycles are now dominated by agricultural fertilization, which has more than tripled the natural background rate of cycling for both. Agriculture is also a major contributor to uh, global warming, accounting for maybe 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, which is twice the transportation sector. It's the major determinant of freshwater consumption, and agricultural land use has historically been one of the most important factors in biodiversity loss. Or another way to think about it, through agriculture, a species that represents about 0.5% of Earth's biomass captures a quarter of the planet's primary productivity. So we should imagine the challenges of global environmental governance taking place on a farmed Earth. That's one way to think about the Anthropocene. The proposal that human influence pervades so many planetary systems that we should imagine ourselves as living in a new epoch of natural history, out of the Holocene and into a post-natural period named after the species remaking the planet in its image. And yet, even so, this massive agricultural system does not feed every member of that species. As you know, about one billion humans lack food, or in other words, one out of every seven humans lives in chronic malnourishment. And meanwhile, several billion just above that threshold aspire to eat better than they do. Particularly, as their incomes rise, they want to eat more animal protein. And moreover, global population is still rising, projected to reach about 10 billion by 2050. Meeting the basic needs of that growing population while delivering the diet that higher income people seem to demand will require a doubling in agricultural output, and that's without any increase in biofuels. So, Agriculture represents an already massive system of energy capture on <coughs> faces intense pressure to deliver even more. Drawing down, to use a metaphor from the climate movement, is not an option in one of the most important anthropogenic drivers of global environmental change. Indeed, it seems to meet human hunger, <coughs> cultivation of the planet must intensify. <coughs> How is that even possible? Uh, David Tillman and Michael Clark, two of the most authoritative food system researchers, find that daily food demand in the wealthiest countries, mostly because of their demand for animal-based foods, requires producing 8,000 calories of food to deliver 3,500 to each person, of which about 25% is wasted. But that seems to be the diet that people want. For as incomes rise, humans everywhere are demanding more meat and more disposable products and empty calories. Combining, there, combining, um, yes, is that, <laughs> you can't see that at all. That is a graph that says as incomes rise, people want more meat. <laughs> so, um, Tillman Clark estimate that the global average diet, if you include forecasts of global per capita income rise, would have to have 31% more meat, 58% more dairy, and feed about 2 billion more people. And that diet finds a research article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences would consume all of humanity's carbon budget in 2015 and more than double the amount of nitrogen that can be safely added to planetary systems. In other words, it would be a disaster for planetary health. Well, maybe it would also be a disaster for human health. So these three um, Harvard public health researchers, summarizing their findings in the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, write that replacing red meat with nuts, fish, poultry, legumes would be optimal for human health. That's a picture of the, uh, the Harvard Healthy Plate. And it just so happens they note that red meat has the highest emissions impact. The diets that promote human health and environmental sustainability broadly intersect, they say. Tillman and Clark, those food system ecologists, they agree. So they assess, I'm sorry these graphs are not as, um, they're not, I'll just tell you what they say. Um, they should really be anything. They assess the, um, these, these scientists assess the greenhouse gas emissions of three diets with better health outcomes. So three diets that are recommended by nutritionists, the Mediterranean, the vegetarian, and the vegetarian. They find that if these were globally adopted, it would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by a third to a half. A dietary transition in that direction, basically away from ruminant meats and toward plants, would cancel out the food demand from population growth, leading to net zero growth in agricultural sector greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so that's a snapshot of food systems and planetary health. 
And I think there's uh, two sort of basic takeaways. One, we have, to re we have to thoroughly rethink what agriculture is. Settler imaginations often think of agriculture as a humanized domain captured from wilderness, from pure nature, and set to productive human use. Among several problems with that idea is that the influence of humans obviously no longer stops at the borders of protected areas. The whole planet, including its forests, now bear the mark of human cultivation. The surface of the planet, it's not farms and cities and wilderness. It's a humanized domain with more or less intensively managed regimes. So in that cultivated planet article, um, the Foley is basically asking us to think about Earth as one big farm. And he writes this, until recently, most agricultural paradigms have focused on improving production, often to the detriment of the environment. Likewise, many environmental conservation strategies have not sought to improve food production. And basically, we have to overcome that dichotomy. So we have to rethink human interaction with biosphere reserves as productive, in addition to protective. Or at least we have to pay attention to the farm work that we are asking our biosphere reserves to do. Absorb nutrients, filter water, pollinate crops, so on. And we also need to think about how agriculture might be protective in addition to being productive, to be protective of ecological systems on which we all depend. For settler North Atlantic societies, that means a tectonic shift in ideas of nature and culture. But it's not as if that's something that we have not heard before. Uh, that human health and ecological health coincide is totally unsurprising to agrarians like Wendell Berry, Eugene Logsman, and Wes Jackson, and Norman Wurzba, who have been voices from that long tradition that connect political health, moral health, bodily health, and soil health. We'll come back to the agrarians. Here's the second takeaway. Uh, the global average diet appears that it must change. In fact, it must reverse, moving in exactly the opposite way from its current direction of transition toward eating more products for moon and animals. All of the ecological analyses support that basic takeaway. Key planetary systems cannot support the expansion of current forms of animal agriculture, yet none of those analyses have an idea for how that reverse of course might happen. Except there's one clue in the data from Tillman and Clark, which is um, inscrutable to you, but there's an arrow pointing to a data point that, says, that shows there's one country that does not follow this trend. This is left coming out here underneath, that has income rise and doesn't want more meat, and that country is India. Why do you say yeah, because food is intimately connected with how we understand ourselves and our worlds, and the connections of religion and identity are some of the um, strongest bonds between food and identity, which makes it very hard to change, but very powerful when you do begin to change. Okay, so now I want to say something about culture, identity, and food ways. Starting from a very funny history, a cultural history of the feast by an archaeologist named Martin Jones who has an hypothesis about where modern grain monocultures came from. He asks, well, why did wheat take over the continent of Europe 1,500 years ago? It's not because it was easier to grow, or because it produced more calories, rye and barley were better adapted to local soil, they could deliver more nutrition, he says. Joan thinks that wheat won because devotion to white bread followed the growth of Christianity, because at the center of the Christian ceremonial feast was an airy bread that needed to be made from wheat. The dark breads made with local grains in Europe became associated with paganism and were abandoned as territories came under the control of Christendom. Historical patterns of cereal agriculture, argues Jones, follow the shifting boundary between pagan and Christian Europe. Under the culinary sign of the Eucharist, wheat bread came to symbolize civilization. And that association endured through the Protestant Reformation, which altered everything else about communion, but not wheat as an ingredient. So we follow Christian settlers around the world. If Jones is even, if he's even partially correct about that, his account suggests that a religious feast has shaped one pathway by which humans are now changing the climate. With the bread of daily tables <coughs> following the cultural preferences developed in the symbolic world of the communion, of the communion table, wheat agriculture now terraforms huge swaths of the Earth's surface, which in turn influences how the planet regulates thermal energy. I mean, that, that does not mean that climate change is a direct consequence of the New Testament any more than it is of eating meat. It just says, it just illustrates that modern paths of agricultural production have been shaped by a culinary aesthetic that was in turn shaped by connections of food and religious identity. 
And of course, you know, that culinary aesthetic is also influenced by the interests of industrial agriculture. So we get uh, journalist long shelf life Wonder Bread. To be clear, I am not saying that Christianity is to blame for Wonder Bread. I'm saying that if Jones is right, Wonder Bread was made possible by a cultural affinity for wheat that was elevated by the Christian feast. And the possibility of, um, of us uh, sharing a derisive laugh at Wonder Bread has been opened, I think, by newer and different feasts. Um, the developing connections of food and identity and the emergence of what's called the alternative food movement. Which is happening around the world. There seems to be this remarkable rethinking of um, our food systems through a kind of political gastronomy, the slow food movement in Europe. Food sovereignty, especially powerful in South America and Sub Saharan Africa and among indigenous political thinkers everywhere. Local tourism and food justice in North America, and of course, you know, there's the new interest in long standing vegetarian and vegan options around which all matter of further qualifiers may gather free range, organic non-GMO, fair trade, and a welfare-certified, bird-friendly, forest-fed, heirloom heritage. Here we go. So we're living this time with a remarkable political and cultural interest in food, not only among foodies, but among social reformers of many sorts. Books about the meaning of food are bestsellers, and the most famous of the food writers, Michael Pollan, suggests that what unites these these many movements is a shared recognition that the industrial food system is unhealthy and unsustainable. In the various ways that movements develop that basic criticism, they're forced to revisit the attachments of identity and inherited food ways. Maybe disrupting them, maybe repairing them. It's not an accident, I think, that Pollan's own book, The On the Wars Dilemma, is dense with a quasi-religious vocabulary. Pollan refers to the karmic price of a meal, to industrial agriculture in terms of a fall, to local food and redemption tropes, and he closes the book by describing his perfect meal in terms of purification, grace, sacrament, and karma again. Yeah. It's confusing. <coughs> but I think he's reaching for a religious metaphor because he's trying to give expression to the depth of meaning at stake in changing food ways. Patricia Storis commenting in the, in the New York Review of Books about the spate of recent publications on food, writes that what makes the new range and possibility of writing about food exciting is that we're witnessing a rare tectonic shifting of a deeply rooted aesthetic and moral hierarchy. Storis remembers that Confucius cultivated manners of eating as a philosophy of life because for him the practice of eating was a microcosm of how humans should govern themselves and the world. That helps explain why intentional departures from the conventional table manners, culinary arts, or agricultural habits of a society can disrupt entire cultural regimes. Ways of eating often connect cultivation of self with governance of nature. As food movements ask us to rethink inherited food ways, they may work to reassess the cosmologies carried by those food ways. The countercultural turn away from journalist monocrop wheat products to whole heritage grains as part of a generational long reversal in North America may now actually disdain white bread and associate dark breads with health and perhaps especially the bread that tastes of local yeast that are made from ancient grains. What drives that kind of change? Okay, bon appetit drives part of that change, yes. <laughs> but there may also be a tectonic, sh there may be some aspect of what Storis is describing as this tectonic shift of a deeply rooted moral hierarchy. The causes of different aspects of the food movement, there are many, obviously, they're contextually diverse. One aspect that I'm interested in is this anxiety about planetary health. So we've just seen, about, we've just seen that um, the food system puts a lot of pressure on the planet. And the, the pressure runs the other way, too. One of the most serious threats of climate change is to grow in food. When climate scientists benchmark temperature changes to the 10,000 year period of human agriculture, they are signaling that the set of ecological conditions in which human agriculture developed is now vulnerable to the implications of having a farm plant. As climate change exerts that kind of biophysical pressure, it also exerts cultural pressure. For example, the, the idea, just
just the idea of anthropogenic climate change destabilizes North American imaginations of nature. It signifies, as Bill McKibben famously put it, the end of nature. Because in US environmental thinking, nature has been more natural and more valuable the more distant it is from humanity. What made wilderness sacred to John Weir and the entire preservation ideal that followed after him was its utter difference from humanity. In an era of pervasive anthropogenic influence over Earth, the conceptual icon for environmental politics can no longer be that nature of pristine wilderness. We're compelled, for better or worse, to think with hybrid natures, always in relation to things. And while it would have outraged Mir, the wilderness mystic who was always kind of embarrassed about his farming. While it would have outraged him, the conceptual icon of U.S. nature writing seemed to be shifting from wilderness to food and farming. In his book After Nature, Jedediah Purdy, a legal scholar too, argues that one reason why food activism has become a site of reformist political attention is because it allows environmental thought to reckon with key uncertainties of life in the Anthropocene. Rather than the politics of protected areas, the next politics of nature, writes Kirby, will be something different and more intense. Active responsibility for the world we make and for the ways of life that world fosters or destroys. As climate change puts pressure on our ideas of nature and culture, food offers a synecdoche of its basic challenge. It's responsibility for a human-made world on which we nonetheless, as hungry animals, remain utterly dependent. So reforming food ways, it offers the possibility of experimenting with new vocabularies in nature, for making biocultural lexicons in which things can be both special and produced, both sacred and cultivated, both wild and farmed, maybe. And it makes sense, then, that agricultural tropes begin showing up in climate discourse. Thinking about climate engineering proposals, the climate scientist Mike Holm has proposed that we think in agricultural terms, we cultivate land, agriculture, we cultivate sea, aquaculture, so now we must recognize that we have begun to cultivate the sky, weather culture, he proposes. The metaphor of cultivation, thinks Holm, opens a better way of thinking about the human relationship with the atmosphere. As with agriculture, the question is not if humans should be involved with it, but what the criteria are for good involvement, which includes deciding what kind of human-climate relationship we want. The intersection itself is not the problem. With care, a product can be beautiful and sustained. The problem with the current human involvement with the atmosphere is that it is haphazard, wasteful, dangerous, unjust, and finally <coughs> tasteless. Everything you don't want in the food system. But, uh, you know, so perhaps now that I mentioned climate engineering, you're beginning to feel some hesitation about this post-natural shift to think of planetary ecology in terms of agriculture. If climate change, if we, sorry, if climate engineering is an implication of this shift from wilderness to agriculture as a place to think about our environments, should we really embrace the idea of cultivating the planet? Holm is not himself arguing for climate engineering, but he's saying we cannot simply reject it as unnatural. For however we want to meet the climate challenge, it's going to require acknowledging a new kind of human role with the planet, one in which humans co-produce Earth's atmosphere. But is, is farming really the sort of relationship with Earth that we want? Several leading teams of Earth scientists have called for reframing ecological research and policy within the concept of planetary stewardship to move away from protecting benchmarks of pure nature toward actively designing planetary systems. And they appeal to the steward, that classic figure of good farming, where it's suggestions of productive responsibility. Agrarian models of relation with their ideal of Careful collaborations of humans and land seem especially attractive to this post-natural ecological thinking, which is maybe one reason why writers like Wendell Berry and Madana Shiva have captured the interest of so many. That they make good farming into an emblem of resistance to industrial exploitation. In the biocultural collaborations through which we make food, think Shiva and Berry, we become violent or caring, exploitative or just, 
And Holm extended that thought to cultivating climate. Rather than putting science, economics, politics, or the planet at the center of the story of climate change, says this scientist, I'm suggesting that we put our self-understanding of human purpose and virtue at the center. Okay, the basic point here is that the ecological significance of food systems goes far beyond the carbon footprint and their nitrogen limits. Food systems reproduce ideas about humanity's purpose and character in the order of things. Eating is an agricultural act, Wendell Berry has famously said, and the rest of his work explains how agriculture inscribes into Earth's body the stories of who people are. The health of the lands from which we eat for Berry depicts the implications of the stories by which we interpret ourselves and our relations. In other words, eating is a cosmological act, too. It's world-making, self-shaping. Considered that way, we might think of alternative food movements as involved in tasks of cosmological reordering as they respond to planetary pressures. As food movements develop new vocabularies of ethical life with nature, you know, maybe they move from stewardship to permaculture, or from settling to unsettling, or from food security to food sovereignty. As they do that, they reset the biocultural context for what Holm calls you know, our self-understanding of human purpose and virtue. So to be clear, I'm not arguing that foodways offer solutions for planetary health. I'm suggesting that they are contexts in which people may reinterpret what health means for us and for the ecologies that we are producing with Earth. Various food ethics carry imaginations of ecological health and of human purposes in cultivating it. Those ecologists um, with which I began, the ones who are connecting agriculture and planetary systems, they set the health parameters by the minimal safe operating space sustaining the current form of civilization, which definitely seems prudent, but it does suggest a possible range in either direction. I mean, we might prefer to cultivate a planet with living coral reefs, for example, which is not included in the parameters of Tillman and Clark, or with rewilded landscape, or maybe with polar bears even. Or, in the other direction, you know, we might prefer the planet that is uh, terraformed for monocrops, optimized for energy capture, with biotic communities redesigned as service systems, and their productivity maximized by markets and distributed by plutocratic demand, which is the, pretty much the planet that our food system is actually now making. As we understand our cuisines to be entangled with planetary systems, our culinary responses may interpret how we imagine preparing relations with Earth. The chef Dan Barber has argued uh, for a cuisine uh, that expresses all the ecological relations of a landscape, that moves beyond ingredients to serve the relations of a working landscape. So um, the example there is a parsnip steak served with bread made from a cover crop and an amount of animal protein proportionate to what the soil can sustain. Barber says of this plate that this, rooted in the natural world, it becomes a blueprint for one big farm, forever in flux, connected to a larger community, narrated by a cook through his food. So Barber is unusual among chefs for the way that his cuisine attempts to explicitly interpret ecological health. And his third plate offers a, a clue, I think, to what might be happening in my, in my opening case of, of the eco halal. That alternative food way may have become a site for adherence to work through uncertainties in the relation of Islam to a changing earth and being Muslim in the Anthropocene. That's happening in part because climate change is putting pressure on every tradition and every culture to interpret how humans relate to the planetary or to incorporate into their stories of purpose and character some account of human relations with a human changed earth. So I would not call uh, Barber's cuisine Religious in just the same way as Islam, obviously, but maybe religious it carries cosmological depths. It's pushing eaters to reconsider their place in an order of things, their purposes and self-understanding. So about this, this cultural turn from wilderness toward food, I'm arguing that food waste offer us sites for developing a post-natural politics of ecological health, a politics in which humans have responsibility for cultivating the ecologies with which we care and on which we remain dependent. If the shift from wilderness to food and environmental thought tracks a larger intellectual shift needed to make moral sense of the Anthropocene, 
then food may well be a site to rethink agriculture and conservation at once, like uh, Foley and the other scientists were suggesting the month. In other words, these new arguments and the ethics of food may represent a tectonic shift from thinking of humanity as separate from nature to rethinking humanity as entangled within biocultural relations. Unless it sounds like I am celebrating a great discovery that just popped up on Dan Barber's plate. Let me quickly say that so many cultures from so many time periods would join the thousand contemporary indigenous voices saying it was stupid to make up separate ideas of nature and culture in the first place. That bad idea, the contingent product of enlightened Europe, you are just now discovering is a civilizational dead end that we told you it was. <laughs> they might be right. That was always the trouble with wilderness, that it reproduces a view of humans as separate from nature. Only people whose relation to the land was already alienated, writes the historian of wilderness, William Cronin, could hold up wilderness as a model for human life and nature. The imagination of wilderness recoils from anywhere humans have done something with their landscape, from cities, from domesticated animals, especially from agriculture, and it refuses infamously to see landscapes made by productive relations with indigenous peoples, through cultivated rainforests, for example. So perhaps the icon for environmental thought has shifted toward food as people seek models for living in urbanized environments and through productive work with landscapes and other creatures. Foodways offer roots toward a reconciled relation with land, toward imagining mutual flourishing of Earth and humans. Okay, uh, let me pause for a moment for some skeptical reconsideration uh, here. Can food movements uh, really bear such deep cultural power? I have so far led you down a path that seems a dream of whole foods. You can solve climate change by purchasing food with a better story about itself. You can enjoy the $300 menu at Dan Barber's restaurant and have the additional <laughs> satisfaction of considering it an act of radical politics. <laughs> Is this not just moralizing elite consumption? Another critique of the turn toward food and agriculture and environmental thought holds that the focus has shifted from wild nature because the wild has already been lost. The effort to protect land and create reserves and save endangered species has just been swamped by pervasive human degradation of planetary systems. So with the wild gone, the green countercultural has retreated to defending the pastoral, or maybe in despair, it's simply retreated to dining well, to an invasion of politics by gastronomy. But maybe, maybe that is exactly wrong. Maybe nature needs defense more than ever right now. Maybe giving in to the idea of the Anthropocene is just capitulation to a farmed planet, to the death warrant of polar bears and coral reefs. Maybe the food movement has been colonized by forces of consumptive capitalism, and so co-opted into another era of, more intensified era of colonizing the planet. Or worse, a still deeper critique of the alternative food movement holds that while colonizing the planet, it may also reproduce the settler colonial mindset that subconsciously warms so many white readers to Michael Pollan and Wendell Berry in the first place. Criticizing what she calls the unbearable whiteness of alternative food movements, the food studies scholar Julie Guthman writes that for some enthusiasts of Berry and Pollan, a romanticized American agrarian imaginary erases the explicitly racist ways in which historically American land has been distributed and labor has been organized. Considering the way that Thomas Jefferson's legacy has functioned in my own context, that seems plausible. Some impulses to local tourism and the Monticello Piedmont of Virginia do indeed seem to be carried by a mostly white nostalgia for a colonial fantasy land of self-reliant, sustainable farmers who have hardly ever existed in part because of the plantation-friendly policies that Jefferson himself supported. In fact, Jefferson's agrarian narrative of independent farmers at the bosom of democratic virtue repeatedly provided the moralization for breaking trees and clearing lands for expansion of a white settler state, a settler state itself still reliant on enslaving people for farm labor while decimating actual self-reliant indigenous food systems. So, consumers reproduce that self-deception when we purchase culinary emblems of agrarian-themed food instead of working to interrupt a food system that continues to depend, 
in structurally racist ways on exploited labor and continues to deplete and structurally set their ways the soil for which everything lives. So the standard American diet eats from a food economy with a plantation mindset, while we dissenters eat from an agrarian economy whose notions of virtue and food production have all along provided the moralization for exploited labor and stolen land. Michael Twitty, in his amazing book, The Cooking Gene, writes that American food ways have only just begun to reckon with the violence done by plantation slavery. How Americans eat and with whom we eat are still shaped by the legacies of white supremacy. Twitter is therefore, a Twitty is therefore, <laughs> Twitter is not, Twitter is not cautious, Twitty is cautious, toward a mostly white food movement's interest in reclaiming historical food ways because his culinary priority is, as he puts it, food being a tool for repair within the walls of black identities. And you can't see the picture here, there, but it shows him unsettling interest in historical food ways by reenacting the role of an enslaved plantation cook on plantations. Uh, he calls it his southern discomfort tool. His performed point, the alternative food ways that may offer for black Americans a way to resist ongoing cultural oppression may, in their adoption by white Americans, unintentionally contribute to that oppression. It's not just what we grow and what we eat, but what it means for who we are, embodied and positioned as we are, and the many different histories from which we come. So, you know, elite foodie consumption is an easy target here. But um, other aspects of the food movement can also deflate political confrontation with injustice. For example, when a food justice project supposes that an effective way to fight hunger in a food desert is to start a community garden, that can make it seem as if the main reason that children are hungry and sick in this country is because their families don't grow food as they should, or at least that their food preferences are not yet fully virtuous. But food deserts are not like naturally occurring features of some landscapes just in need of some urban homesteading, and they're not, they don't reflect consumer preferences. They are made scarcities. They're the result, obviously, of food and water fleeing poverty and flowing toward wealth. So maybe the reason that so many children are malnourished in this country is because their families have been systematically impoverished. Insofar as that's true, then maybe realistically fighting childhood malnourishment requires intensifying conflict with a racist plutocratic economy. So maybe busying ourselves with community gardens and nutrition classes just reinforces this idea that unhealth in our food system is attributable to ignorant choices, to vice. You know, if only more people read Michael Pollan's food rules, it would be better. If only people read those scientists of planetary health with which I began, as they should, and then turned to eat more plants, if only they knew, if only they made better choices, then our personal health and our planetary health would be better. So you can see the line of the critique. The problem with ecological foodism is not just that it's like it's fully affluent or it's more culturally attractive to white people. It's that it imagines political ecologies in ways that obscure injustice and naturalize privilege. That's pretty tough, unsettling critique, and I'm not going to fully rescue the food movement from it. But, but, Twitty suggests in that comment about repairing black identity from the legacy of white supremacy by recovering heritage food ways, that alternative food movements may also work to resist or repair systemic injustice. The coalition of Immokalee workers has resisted the, I mean, has connected the fields of data to modern slavery and helped revivify efforts for food worker justice. The food sovereignty movements within indigenous networks have brought new attention to the way settler colonialism continues to disrupt indigenous food systems and have made reclaiming those food ways a practice for indigenous collective survival. In sub-Saharan Africa, the food sovereignty movement has mobilized attention to the great new land grab happening across the global south as corporate agricultural producers from northern hemispheres seek to lock in land and water resources, partially in response to climate uncertainties created by the global north agricultural system. So you can see how adaptations to climate change can reinscribe and naturalize vulnerabilities caused by um, climate change. So even slow food, even slow food has uh, serious political roots. Carlos Petrini, the Italian founder of the slow food movement, has actually called for a gastronomy of liberation, which he says entails liberation from unevenness, oppressions, violence perpetrated on environmental people, the scandal of hunger, and malnutrition. The Italian scholar of slow food, 
Sarah Nellie will know. She traces this backstory of the slow food leaders interpreting landscapes as a record of violence suffered by the world poor, overlaid by violence suffered through industrial transformation. With no romantic nostalgia for an agrarian past, it seeks liberation from violences written into the body of the land and the bodies of its poor. She writes, slow food in Europe is the claim for food justice, which means justice for the people that eat the food, justice for the communities that produce it, justice for the land that sustains the production, and justice for the biosphere that enables these processes and eventually absorbs their effects. And she um, observes that in the United States, slow food participants like, like pollen repeat the training slogan, the pleasure is political, without actually attending to the movement's politics. This possibility of slowly, deeply countering violence is long accumulated and inscribed into our land. I find it especially helpful in this dark period for U.S. democratic justice and environmental policy. Legacies of white supremacy and planetary environmental problems are overwhelming enough without having to confront actual white supremacists or the cynical climate politics of our current administration. Reforming foodways can work upstream from those politics. It's not to say, obviously, that in despair we can eat well and call it hope. It's to say that a table is a political gathering and a biological assembly. In the social and ecological relations we convene there at our tables, and in the stories into which we incorporate them, we may be able to remember and begin to repair the violences that we inherit. The politics of climate change are difficult not just because of their capture by fossil fuel interests. Planetary problems unfold within systems and relations that no individual directly causes or experiences. And this makes them just, it makes them difficult for our political imagination, our moral imagination to get its mind around. Humanity is causing radiative forcing in the atmosphere, but no one in particular does that. And the experience of its consequences are perceptible only through probabilistic interpretations unfolding in nonlinear ways across unfamiliar scales of space and time. <coughs> the rise of humanity as an agent of planetary change is divorced from the agency that we have in our everyday moral lives. And so it can seem to overwhelm us at the ordinary scale. The philosopher Bruno Latour says, people are not equipped with the mental and emotional repertoire to deal with such a vast scale of events. They have difficulty submitting to such a rapid acceleration for which, in addition, they're supposed to feel responsible, while in the meantime, this call for action has none of the traits of their older, their older revolutionary dreams. I mean, that's maybe one reason why it's hard to get people to work on climate change. You're asking people to get involved with a problem that can't be solved, and it can't be solved at the level at which they can act. I keep teaching a class right now, an undergraduate class on climate ethics, and I, um, I don't think they realize how hard the ask really is. <laughs> I'm asking them to be committed to a problem that they can't solve in their lifetime. So in this very historical moment that humans learn that our powers have made us responsible for the planet, we find ourselves overwhelmed by the scales of agency involved, and so we may feel powerless to exercise responsibility. Food is different. No one has to convince you that dinner is a problem, or that you need to take responsibility for it, or that there are ways of successfully doing so. You're probably working on that problem right now with an increasingly large amount of your mind, wondering what you're going to have for dinner, and when is this lecture going to end, <laughs> and what will be left for me to eat after this lecture. Precisely because food is so basic and everyday, intimately involved, those stories that shape our identities, foodways offer arenas in which to enact agency, to interpret complex systems. You know, whereas the ability to act meaningfully seems undermined by global structures, overwhelmed by planetary systems, food choices remain a site of relative freedom. It's hard, almost impossible to escape fossil energy, but ordinary persons may come to sense in a food choice the opportunity to choose between biocultural systems of sustenance, which I think is why all those um, qualifying aggregators, bird friendly and fair trade and paleo, are um, why they become important, because they're offering choices between an industrial metabolism and some other alternative metabolism. And meanwhile, precisely because food is a material driver of planetary systems and global structures, doing things with food 
can be used to register discontent with the systems that seem to undermine local agency. They allow eaters to affiliate with alternatives. They allow producers to participate in networks of responsibility, like fair trade, or to envision entirely different civilizational arrangements, which I think is basically what permaculture does. The, that discontent, that's not just a possibility for, the, for affluent consumers. The political theorists David Schlossberg and Roman Coles argue that such practical discontent should not be seen as a post-materialist affordance for the wealthy. Focusing on food justice projects in Detroit, they argue that by seeking different material circulations of sustenance, some food movements enact different possibilities of political circulation even different human-earth relations. They call that a prefigurative politics, a way of practicing disbelief in the current main channels of circulation by organizing and performing alternatives. So in that case, food movements, they don't necessarily represent an evasion of politics, but neither do they have to explain how they can be immediately scaled up to a feasible solution. Because the point is there are sites where individuals and communities are dissenting from some biopolitical system and imagining alternative metabolism. I, met, I think you can interpret permaculture especially that way. The anthropologist of morality, Mary Mattingly, talks about um, everyday life as a moral laboratory, where um, sometimes the quotidian places of life become sites where we invent new possibilities, just in the little problems that we face. Places where we might invent an expansion of political agency, places to deepen moral imagination in the face of challenges that maybe overwhelm our cognition. Places to take our cultural toolkits and the possibilities of our inherited soils and acknowledging all the violence done to both cultivate new possibilities for them. I'm going to close by returning to this case of eco halal. In the course of making an argument that her fellow Muslims should become vegetarian, Kisha Ali from a nearby Boston University argues that eco halal concern for animals and ecology appropriately diminishes the performance of authentic Muslim identity while nonetheless elevating interest in how food practices construct a habitually virtuous self, which on her interpretation is the primary goal of being Muslim. Islamic identity is not sublimated to the planetary on, on that view because for Ali, the tradition contextualizes the development of globally concerned food practices within distinctively Muslim habits of self-scrutiny, hospitality, moderation, within Muslim virtues. So the particular moral practices that produce an Islamic self incorporate planetary relation, and the fact that they have a broader context for developing a virtuous person guards against some of those liabilities to which I've just suggested food movements are exposed. So the self-scrutiny, the hospitality, and moderation are moral habits that can help prevent vegetarianism or any other alternative food way from becoming a mere consumer identity or grounds for elitist judgment of non-vegetarians, and they are ideally what separates eco-halal vegetarian practice from other forms of vegetarianism. So what Ali suggests, if I can extend her argument more generally, is that one way to cultivate durable disbelief in the moral economy of our dominant food ways is to locate alternative practices in some relatively comprehensive understanding of the purposes of a life, one that includes some vision of appropriate biocultural relations with others, including other animals, landscapes, maybe Earth, and maybe even God. And so now we think here comes the sneaky religious conclusion. Yeah, I'm not, but I'm not arguing that you have to have a con you have to have conventional religious beliefs in order to situate food ways in that broader account of a human life and its purposes. But I am suggesting that doing so, insofar as food ways do that, is an exercise with existential dimensions that could be aptly described as religious or religious. And although they come into view especially clearly when we see someone, an Islamic scholar like Kisha Ali, do it, the depths of moral and political interpretation that I have in mind happen in accounts that don't take themselves to be religious. Um, I'm just going to name two. I'll close with these two. The scholar of animism, uh, Graham Harvey, argues that religion is not about identifying with cognitive beliefs anyway. Religion is, he says, fundamentally about how people negotiate what to eat, with whom to have sex, and how to treat strangers. In fact, Harvey speculates that the first everyday problem from which archaic religion arose was the awkward need of some beings to eat other beings. 
Religion arose, Marvi is arguing, as a cross-species etiquette of eating, a way of negotiating the taking of life. And now food practices, modern alternative food practices, might be trying to develop new forms of cross-species etiquette. In particular, ritual gratitude for the creatures who become our food may give them a place at our table as participants. And it's possible to consider some alternative food ways that way. It's possible to consider locavorism an animal-friendly food in that kind of post-humanist, pre-religious way as commensality with landscapes, with animals, and with the relations of the living world. In her book, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, which arises from an intersection of indigenous thinking and academic biology, the, the Potawatomi scholar Robin Wall Kimmerer writes of a practical reverence cultivated in certain indigenous ways of sustenance. She goes on to say that practical reverence is a first step toward learning the grammar of animacy, which she holds as necessary for the new peoples living on this continent. Indigenous languages and practices have greater aptitude for that grammar, she says. But Kimmerer, in a, what is a controversial form of generosity, suggests that immigrant cultures to Turtle Islands, to North America, may also learn it, even in their own grammatically impoverished languages, and so begin to become not native, but naturalized to this place. Being naturalized to place, she writes, means to live as if this is the land that feeds you, as if these are the streams from which you drink, that build your body and feed your spirit. So if, if Harvey and Kimmerer are on to something, then certain food ways may begin to do deep work in the cultural headwaters upstream from our climate politics. They can be practices that let land work on our moral imaginations, in which relations with other creatures can begin to make claims on us. They can unsettle the stories settler people tell ourselves, and they can name the violences we inherit from slavery. One step for a kind of dark hope in these early days of the Anthropocene, even living in an American petrostate whose powers are largely celebrated by its dominant religion, there lies the possibility of practical reverence, of cultivating gratitude and knowledge and beauty at our tables. So I've made this space between ethics of food and the health of the planet do some work for us in a way that uh, excavates the potential for intentional food practices to do biocultural work, but not suggesting that a particular diet or a particular food ethic is the solution to planetary problems. I've not peddled any solutions, dietary or religious. I've just argued that alternative food ways offer the potential, or at least the analogy of, a, of the potential that we need to interpret our inheritances of cultural violence and to experiment with growing new things from the soil.
communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Certainly some, some parts of the alternative food movement do seem to rely on having a lot of financial resources. Paleo, and not always, but often veganism. Um, yes, no doubt. Um, not, but not other parts of the um, food movement. So um, food sovereignty is, is very, it takes a lot of different forms in different areas, but that often um, is, is um, actually trying to get away from the financialization of food. Um, but to your, to your good question about, okay, so what, what to do about the lack of access to healthy, good food. Um, and the rub, the rub to which you rightly point, is that it looks like the kind of food that learned people say um, ought to be available both for personal health and planetary health is simply too expensive. And so then it looks like it's, it's even just moralism. Um, and so I think I have, I don't have a solution to that. I have two things to say about it. One is that um, the reason that uh, often the reason that good food is more expensive and bad food is less expensive is because bad food is subsidized. So we have a bad food that is not paying its full cost. It's not paying its full cost in human health. It's not paying its full cost in planetary health. And it's not just paying, it's just not paying its full economic costs. So it's unnaturally low. The price is unnaturally low, which makes it more rational to eat it. So, okay, that's a big problem. And then our farm bill basically reproduces that problem. And that's probably the, any satisfactory resolution of the kind of problems that we're talking about has to happen in that kind of macroeconomic way. And on the other side of that is, um, I, I described um, the financial situation of families experiencing food insecurity in a kind of sharp way, systematically impoverished. Mm -hmm. Insofar as you agree with that, um, then however you think about the remedies for systematic impoverishment would also be part of making good food available. I mean, it's a good question, but it doesn't have a great answer. Thank you for your talk. Thank you for talk. Um, I'm curious what you think about in ethical terms and aesthetic and religious or any ways that you want to talk about it, the impossible burger. Ah, uh, that's another great, I don't know, what do you think about that? What do you think? Okay, but you, okay, but I have no real good thoughts about that. I want to hear what Tyler Flynn thinks about that. Yeah, um, it's really interesting. Is there the possibility of, um, um, well, two possibilities. I mean, are there basically plant-based realistic alternatives for what people want when they want meat? And um, is there a possibility for animal flesh that does not involve living animals? So that's interesting. So it's two, there's it's like two tracks to try and get away from the problem of, of food products from ruminant animals. Um, and I guess I would say I'm cautiously interested in both. I don't have the, the, um, the recoil from it uh, that some people do. Both, some people will recoil from it. both of those. Some people stash it from um, the kind of biotech animal tissue that doesn't involve an animal um, growing animal protein. Um, I think those are really, they're interesting. It's hard to imagine how, what's hard to imagine for me is how do how does those foods become part of a culturally important food way such that they are become produced? That's probably because my imagination is slightly impoverished. I just don't see how that would happen, but it very well could, right? I mean, other crazy foods have been invented that are now widespread, and often there were, there were often religious communities that did. I mean, tofu, his, its history is in Buddhist monasteries, and there was a reason why they went to the, to the trouble of inventing this kind of weird food that then becomes like basically a, more or less a staple in many food societies, right? So something like that could happen. What do you think? Well, I have mixed feelings about it. I, I guess the one part of it that troubles me is the uh, you know, if you th there's a whole tradition of vegetarianism which associates it with nonviolence, yeah. and the you know the thing about that burger because I I actually was served one without knowing what it was and you know started eating it and after how many years forty years of being a vegetarian it was an unsettling experience. Yeah. 
blood. It, the blood and the, you know, so it really is kind of trying to reproduce in some ways the sort of violence yeah. of, of eating flesh. So that, I wonder about that. That is such an interesting thing because, oh, well, I think it's so funny to it, but I am interested in the ways that there are forms of vegetarianism that are deeply rooted in nonviolence, and sometimes the nonviolence is, um, is holistic, so it's even, a, it's even kind of a, a withdrawal from or a negative evaluation of violence in nature, suffering and predation. Um, but that is that word here. And he, yes, and he has many better theological things to say about violence in nature. But um, so vegetarianism holds this, can carry this negative evaluation of, of violence in nature or violence in society. And so, yeah, then if you have a plant based burger that is nonetheless trying to give you a bloody experience, what happens to what it's doing for your moral formation? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, I think a lot of the issues that we have with the food system may come from like problems with the food industry itself, and I'm just wondering how you may suggest um, pushing back against big food companies that have um, a financial incentive to continue producing maybe foods that are unhealthy for our planet. Yeah. Right. What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> you have any ideas? Oh, yeah. Well, that's one thing, right? I mean, this is what, this, that's Mary Nestle's response, basically, who's written, like, the book on food politics and, uh, and the, um, the influence of the food industry, both over eaters and over our, our policy environment. Um, and, of course, her main, her main view is that you simply have to intervene with better political structures, but her secondary view is you vote with your fork. Uh, and so you can, you, you can, if nothing you do it, realign your incentives. Um, so that's one way. Um, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm interested in, without suggesting that there's lots of uh, solutions and hope there, but I'm interested in what happens um, in alternative food movements that are not interested in reforming the dominant food system, but interested in recreating an entirely different one, imagining an entirely different one from the ground up. And, um, people do that in lots of different ways. Um, and I think part of the reason they, they want to do that is because it's, it's, it's a vote of distrust in the standard American food system, right? Um, and, you know, insofar as more people af associate um, standard, the standard food system, not only with unhealth, but with um, planetary decline, or with political violence, or with exploited labor, um, that, that creates a more difficult financial environment for them. Which might just mean then, you know, non-viable foods. <laughs> and you, so, um, I think the market will respond, right? The market will respond to, to, to ethical and aesthetic food preferences. Um, and then there's this constant, that you see it in food moves, there's this constant, unsettled negotiation of how they're going to interact with the um, industry side of forms, which is probably always just a contextual, pragmatic negotiation. Mm -hmm. We have one more question. Hi there. Um, you mentioned some of the labels around religious, um, like the eco labels around kosher and yeah. halal and those things, and even the influence of the ch of what churchgoers eat and how that played a role in wheat farming. Yeah. So, what space do you think that there might be for these moral institutions of religious order to influence our eating habits? The Pope put out. Laudato Si, right? Yeah. His um, document talking about climate change. Right. So they have uh, millions of followers, right? So what, what opportunity do you think there might be for these moral institutions to kind of shift our cultural eating habits? So I'm interested in the outcome of that question. Uh, and I, I, I noticed that Laudato Si at the end, when he's recommending um, different particular practical actions, one of them is the table grace as being an especially important response to um, global ecological problems. 
It didn't have a lot to say about dietary practices and not much about, about eating what's meat, for example, which could well have gone in that same section. Um, but I, I think, yeah, it definitely makes, a, it makes an impact on the culinary register of many people when some um, very significant religious authority like the Pope or like the Dalai Lama who sometimes talks about um, food in a compassionate life. Um, such that it, I, I don't know that it makes people change their ways, you know, like, okay, so the Pope said it, and so therefore I'm going to stop eating hamburgers as much. But I do think in a, maybe in a, it's possible that in a, in a deeper way, the, you know, the hamburger just becomes seen as less innocuous and more caught up in um, the political and social things that religious communities are trying to witness against. I think we have one more question and we'll finish with here. Can we pass the mic up here? Yeah, we actually had had it in someone's hand back here. Oh, we do. Did someone else have a question? Yeah. Okay. I have a question. And I was curious, you're talking about the way that food waves are almost a manifestation of identity and they, they build this idea of self a yeah. lot of times and who one believes they might be in a moral or ethical sense. Yeah. And so I'm kind of curious throwing in the, the pressure and the motivation of economic valuation into that and how food is economically valued and in general can it be economically valued as we, we talk about this kind of uh, driver and the, the economy is a huge part of this question like brought up earlier how um, it, it is an incentive to purchase certain kinds of foods mm -hmm. so I'm wondering in this kind of bridging the gap I suppose how as people, how the like, economic perspective on like valuation in of building of oneself in like the way that they one place themselves in the way that they build food is in respect to the way that they put an economic value on that food. Yeah, that's, that's, that's yes. Okay. That's a naughty. That's a naughty problem. It's really interesting, right? So okay, so if I'm saying that food can be a site for moral formation and even identity formation. You're saying, well, yeah, but food is also a consumer product, right? And so people have to spend money on this, and that's, and that's, that's not going to be caught up just with their ideas about food, um, and even aside from whatever financial constraints they have, it's also going to be caught up with their ideas about what is an appropriate amount of money to spend on fashioning my identity. Exactly. Yes, very good point. Um, so um, near the end, what I found especially helpful, why I turned to um, Kisha Ali and why I find her especially helpful is she's trying to... She's placing the alternative food way vegetarianism for her within the broader context of um, the kind of moral ecology of Islam. So the virtues that she thinks are at the heart of what uh, formation of Muslim identity is about. And so it nests that inside it. And then, then you, have, um, you have a way, anyway, of evaluating what is appropriate and inappropriate, proper and improper attention to this site of identity formation. Because otherwise, yes, um, you know, Americans are very good at just creating another form of consumerist identity performance. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we'll pause officially here, but I think that you might be willing to take a few yeah. informal questions after. Um, before we wrap up, just a couple of um, very quick announcements about upcoming events in the Park Street series. Our next event is actually co-sponsored with the Lowell series. So it will actually take place on a Wednesday, unusual for us. Natasha Trepaway will be coming to speak on Beyond Katrina on Wednesday, March 14th, which is just after the break. And then our final speaker in the series is Nikki Silvestri, who will be speaking about healthy soil and healthy bodies. But please join me now in warmly thanking our speaker for tonight.